is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The High Lord by Trudy Canavan, brought to you by Ashley. In this section, I am covering chapters four, five, six, and seven, in which we finally discover what the deal is with Acheron. And I am really pleased that my theory that he was doing something for the good of all that everyone didn't understand is proven to be correct. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Um, again, many thanks to Ashley for commissioning this book, the third book in the trilogy. Um, so I am there. There, the fourth chapter of this section, um, which was chapter seven, was it fell in a spot where I could either have stopped after reading three, and have only done like 42 pages instead of my usual 50 or I could read chapter seven and do like 56 pages. And unsurprisingly, as somebody who does not have a modicum of self-restraint most of the time, I decided to go ahead and read further rather than otherwise. And uh, I'm really glad because everything winds up tying in a lot with the first three chapters. So I feel like this four chapter section really works as an, as an, its own arc. So, okay, let's start off because we get to everything at the end of the like last two, but we start off with Rothen. Um, and what's going on with Rothen is a little weird here because it feels like he hasn't got any friends anymore. And I know that that's not true because he had friends visiting him and making sure that he wasn't like taking too much of that sleeping drug and, you know, checking in on him to make sure that he is okay with the fact that Sania has clearly kind of moved on. So we've seen that. But the way this starts off is he's in the night room with all of the other magicians and guild members coming in to chat. And he's like watching um, Balkan, Venara, and Saren chatting together and it says Rothen wished he could hear their conversation the three had been talking energetically for an hour whenever anything was debated among the higher magicians these three were the most vocal and most influential speakers between Balkan's direct reasoning Venara's compassion and insight and Saren's conservative opinions they usually managed to cover most most sides of an issue but Rothen knew he would never get near enough to the trio to listen without being observed which I was just like, why couldn't they just come and why wouldn't he just go and talk to them? You know, I I don't know if it's just because they're heads of their sections. And so he feels like he doesn't belong there. But I don't feel like they would completely rebuff him. And even if he was observed, like, I doubt they're in the night room talking about anything that's like they're not willing some for someone to overhear. I just really it was a surprising like. He acts almost in this section like he's trying to gather intelligence on something specific. Um, But he winds up turning to a conversation that Lorlin is having with, uh, with, who is it? I'm trying to find the the name of the person that he's chatting with. Um, Pekin. Right, right, right. Lord Pekin. Um, And they're talking about this observatory tower. And it's really interesting because he says, I do not, out Pekin, who is objecting to this whole thing, I do not see the need for the warrior's involvement. Is this structure going to be for alchemic or military use? Both, Lorland told him. The High Lord decided it would be short-sighted to construct a building of this kind without considering its defensive potential. He also saw that it was unlikely that the building would be approved by the king if its use was solely for monitoring the weather. 
So I really like this because after what we have found out in the later chapters, we know that there is a genuine threat to kill Arya. We know that the the guild itself is not nearly as strong as we thought because they may have magic, but they don't have that good, good magic and they aren't going to be able to hold up against people who are willing to do something really like brutal. And so he, what, what Akron has kind of done here has, is he has um, backdoored in this, this tower that's meant for defense by pretending that he only threw in the defensive measures for it as a side effect to make sure that it is approved. Whereas what I think is really going on is that it's primarily going to be a defensive thing. But he knew that nobody else realizes that there's any sort of threat in the first place and wouldn't be concerned about it. So he has has sold it as something to do with weather watching to make it feel more palatable to most people. And that's pretty fucking clever. I think that's what he's done. You know, like I could be wrong about his involvement in this. I, it could be that somebody came to him with the idea and he only approved it because he saw the potential. It might not have even originally been his idea, but whatever the case, I'm really curious what good it would even do because whether you can see them coming or not, it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to stand up against this. Like based on what Sania reads later, a tower is only going to, give you a head start in knowing that you're about to be annihilated. You know what I'm saying? So I hope that this is part of a multi-step plan of defense and not the thing that he's going to be kind of relying on. But I don't know if he really has any ideas as of yet. Um, so Pekin says something at this point that really gets Rothen's attention. I have heard that Sunia will not be attending evening classes now. Is this true? It is, Jarek replied. The High Lord spoke to me yesterday. A few of her teachers had commented to me that she appeared to be tired and was easily distracted. Acheron had made the same observation and agreed to let her have the evenings free for the rest of the year. What of those subjects she has already begun studying? She'll have to begin them again next year, though she won't have to repeat any projects if she doesn't need to. Her teachers will take into account what she has covered already. Will she be favoring a discipline? This will make it even more necessary that she focus her efforts on one soon, or she will not be proficient in any by graduation. Acheron hasn't decided yet, Lorlin replied. Acheron hasn't decided, Jarek repeated. The choice is Sania's. There was a pause. Of course, Lorlin agreed. What I meant by that is Acheron hasn't indicated to me which he'd prefer her to choose, so I'm assuming he hasn't decided what to recommend. Maybe he doesn't want to influence her in any way, which is why he and then they start to fade off as they walk away. Um, so Rothen has a moment of being like a little worried that Sunia isn't going to evening classes, thinking that she's going to be Akron, be around Akron a lot more often if she's not in class. But then he realizes that Sunia is not going to choose to be like at home in Akron's presence if she has that free time. She's going to go to the library and be around other people and safely away from him. So he overall seems to think that this is for the best. I would like to register my, my sort of admiration, I guess, for the way the guild handles things, that they can all see that she's overtired. And we know as readers what this is really about, that she is con like really... Uh, she's been doing a lot of reading of things that are disturbing to her. She is in a situation that is very stressful, but they think that it's that she's overtaxing herself with classes, which I am positive doesn't help. Um, and they decide that this is that the best thing to do is to ease up the load on her a little bit. And there isn't like a lot of, you know, there's a little concern about her making sure that she's able to regroup when she starts some of these subjects again. But other than that, there's no sort of judgment about the fact overall that she is exhausted. Um, it's almost like they all sort of understand that she being as proficient as she is at so many, basically 
the the strength that she has maybe that she's getting more pressure put on her because of it and so they are willing to give her a little bit of a break because they all recognize that she's being kind of like um you know she's a star student in some ways i think and i just really appreciate that they are willing to like let her take a step back and rest i you know there's a lot of schools that it's pretty much sink or swim and if you sink, it's implied that it's just because you aren't good enough. And I find that to be really offensive, frankly. Like, as somebody who went to a school that was like that, it's gross. And it just, it's not, like, respectful of the fact that people are human and all capable of different amounts of, like, grueling labor. And I just really like the fact that the guild is flexible in that way. Um, so then we go to Daniel and Tyend. And Daniel, this is so funny because Tyend is just so not good at this like subterfuge and he doesn't think through the implications of what he's saying and doing. Um, but so we ended um, the last section with them talking about this guy that was involved in a rebellious group of people who are interested in like learning magic and and teaching it to each other without being part of the guild which is like real real strictly against the rules the kind of against the rules where if you're caught doing it you will be killed that kind of thing and tyend had been invited and turned the guy down and then runs into him at a party here and blurts out to the guy that, like, wow, it's real weird that you haven't been uh, inviting me to your parties since I've started hanging out with Daniel so much. And doesn't fucking, it doesn't even occur to him that saying it in that way implies that he knows what the meetings are for. And that maybe he will tell Daniel, who is part of the guild, who will have them killed for this. Like, Tyan just did not think this through at all. And Daniel is so frustrated because he's like, you know, on the one hand, I don't, I, I shouldn't expect you to like know how to handle this. But on the other hand, like, I wish you would fucking talk to me before you went and blurted this shit out. And now we're in danger. And the whole thing was supposed to be that they gave the man something to blackmail them with before they got involved with this secret group so that the man would feel he had something on them to keep them from blabbing. But because this man has found out that Tyen suspects before he has any blackmail material, it means that now they need to like quickly feed him blackmail material so that he won't kill them, which this is a very tricky proposition. Um, so what they wind up doing is later on, and I'm not even remembering where they're heading to, but they stop at an inn and have a meeting with this guy. And Daniel sort of hints to him that I am willing to teach outside of what the guild, outside of what they find appropriate because I want to take care of Tyen and I'm worried that if anything were to happen, that they would come after him and he can't defend himself. So if you can offer some kind of protection, then, you know, it's sort of, it, it's, it's like, he's sort of trying to make it like, well, I'd be willing to work with you on this, even though it's against the law, because the stakes are so high for me, if anything were to go wrong, that maybe looking to outside um, sources for help is going to be my only option, which is a pretty smart way to handle it. I was, um, I confess, a little concerned when they meet up with the guy and they're drinking wine with him because I thought he might have done something to it. But apparently it gets uncorked by the, um, the innkeeper, like right in front of them. So that's something. Um but yeah, this, so they're doing some damage control there. And I'll be interested to see what winds up happening here. Um, so let's talk about the book that Akron gives to Sunia. Um, 
he comes to her room and she thinks that it's Viola with the uh, with her nightly cup of Raka that she's always excited for. And it is not. It is Akarin and he has two books, which it turns out are the same book. One of them is the original and a lot of the writing has faded, but he gives it to her so that she can see the copy is accurate and that he didn't change anything in it. And he and and the copy is one that he wrote and in the spots where like writing has faded away um in the original he just sort of fills in like so this is where it faded out and this is what i think it probably said and what the book is is a record from over 500 years ago of the uh of the guild and This is really interesting to me. Like, obviously, it's super interesting to Sunia because she stays up for hours reading this thing. Um, But it's a record of, like, the daily um, goings-on, bits of gossip, accomplishments, you know, just that general kind of thing. It's basically like a journal. It is written by one person, but it's about the guild at large and not necessarily about his personal life. Um, so she, at first, make sure to just check at random intervals the pages against the original. And she doesn't see any changes whatsoever. It looks like he's copied it exactly. So she begins to read. And then she comes to this part that she's like blown away by. Because the person writing seems like an amiable sort who admires the different people who are at the guild. Um the fact that uh, th- this is the guild he knew was very different from the one she understood. Magicians took on apprentices in exchange for money or assistance. Then a comment by the author made it clear what that assistance entailed, and she stopped aghast. These early magicians strengthened themselves by drawing magic from their apprentices. They used black magic. They called it the higher magic. She looked at the spine and saw that she was a quarter of the way through the book. Continuing, she found records gradually focused on the activities of a wayward apprentice, Tajin. It was discovered that the young man had taught himself higher magic against the wishes of his master. Abuses were uncovered. Tajin had taken strength from ordinary folk, which was never done except in times of great need. The record keeper expressed disapproval and anger, Then his tone abruptly changed to fear. Tajin had used his higher magic to kill his master. The situation grew steadily worse. As the magicians of the guild sought to punish him, Tajin killed indiscriminately to gain the strength to resist them. Magicians reported the slaughter of men, women, and children. Whole villages were all but destroyed, with only a few survivors to report the malicious nature of their attacker. Um, and as she continues, um, yesterday's attempt to subdue him appears to have sent him into a passion. The last reports say he had slaughtered all in the villages of Tenker and Foray. He is beyond all controlling, and I fear for the future of us all. I am amazed that he has not turned on us yet, but perhaps this is his preparation for that final strike. Fifty-two magicians strengthened by their apprentices and the livestock donated by frightened commoners hadn't been able to defeat Tajin. The next few entries recorded his random path through Karelia. So there's a couple revelations there. First being that Tajin, like, well, first let's talk about the fact that they can draw on the strength of livestock, which never even occurred to me. I assumed that there was something about the consciousness of humans that was important to the power that they were taking on. But apparently it's not. It's sheer life force, which is like, you know, available in any living thing. Um, And we see this a second later. The view from my window is ghastly. Thousands of Gorin, Enka, and Reber rot in the fields, their strength given to the defense of Kirelia too many to eat so they're just killing all of these animals killing their food supply in order to keep this guy from slaughtering everybody and it's not even working 
You know, they're sacrificing all of this. And the guy is still fucking escaping and winning and killing. They, he takes out um, Lord Garen, Lord Deeran, Lord Winnell, and Lady Ella. So four full-grown magicians. And he kills them. No problem. Um, and then finally, it is over. When Alik told me the news, I dared not believe it. But an hour ago, I climbed the stairs of the lookout and saw the truth with my own eyes. It is true. Tajin is dead. Only he could have created such destruction in his final moments. Lord Eland called us together and read a letter sent from Indria, uh, Indria, Tajin's sister. She told of her intention to poison him. We can only assume that she succeeded. So that's interesting. Only he could have created such destruction in his final moments, which we know that when they die, there's, you know, a burst of energy. Um, but the fact that because he says, I climbed the stairs of the lookout and saw the truth with my own eyes. So she must live close by that he was able to see it um, because I assumed that Indria was poisoning him at her home. But the fact that they don't see the body I find weird like uh, does that burst of energy that they have when they die does that explode them or something or disintegrate them make it so that there is no body um I maybe Rothen and Daniel mention this at the end of the first book but I don't remember um so then the record keeper recounted a slow restoration the magicians who had left returned the stores and libraries were set in order again. Sania mused over the long entries covering the common people's losses and recovery. It appeared the guild had once been concerned for the well-being of ordinary people. Truly, the old guild was destroyed with Tajin. I have heard some say that a new guild was born today. The first of the changes occurred this morning when five young men joined us. They are our first novices, apprenticed to all and not one. They will not be taught the higher magics until they have proven themselves trustworthy. If Lord Karen has his way, they will never learn them at all. Support for the ban of what Lord Karen had begun to call black magic increased. Sania turned a page and found one last entry, followed by blank pages. I have not the gift of foresight, nor do I pretend to know enough of men and magic to guess the future. But after we made our decision, I was gripped by a fear that the Sachakans might rise against us again in the future, and the guild would be found unprepared. I proposed a secret store of knowledge to be opened only if the guild faced certain destruction. The others of my company agreed, for many of my fellows held the same secret fear." It was decided that the existence of a secret weapon would be known by would be known of by the head of warriors only. He would not know its nature, but would pass the location down to his successor. I now finish this record here. Tomorrow I will begin a new one. I sincerely hope that nobody will ever open this book and read these words. Below this last entry was a note. Seventy years later. Lord Coral, head of warriors, died in a practice bout at the age of 28. It is likely he did not have an opportunity to pass on the knowledge of the secret weapon. So, there is a secret weapon, and it remains to be seen whether or not it's like the chest full of books that Corrin discovered when he wrote in his thing about manipulating stone, or if it's a whole other thing. Because nobody was given the information. Um, so yeah, that's fucking intense, right? And that all gets revealed in the, in the first chapter of this section, chapter four. Um, so let's talk about Sari, because he's uh, hanging out with this chick, Savara. Now, Sari, it turns out, is working for Akron, which didn't even enter my head. I knew that he was working for somebody, but I figured it was one of the thieves, like one of the head of the thieves guilds and that they just didn't know about each other, that we just weren't going to find out exactly which one until later or something. But it turns out that he's doing some shit that even the other thieves don't know about. Um, and Savara is uh, growing a little bit bored being shut up in this room and watched so that they know that she's not influencing things and has started to fight with some of the guards, like practice bouts of fighting. Um, 
and wins pretty much every time. When Sari goes up against her later, it is a draw. She has a knife up to his stomach and he has one against her armpit. So it's a pretty much a draw. Um, but it's the first of anyone that she's fought who could hold up their end of it. So I think she's a little impressed with him and he's clearly impressed with her. And he also is very attracted to her, but is aware of how dangerous that is and keeps trying to sort of tamp it down, which is amusing. Um, so it turns out that she knows who he's working for as well. And he's very unnerved by that. Um, she says, okay, where is the spot? Um, oh, yes. Will you accept my help? Can you lead us to him? Yes, she replied without hesitation. What do you want in return? She moved closer to his desk. That you say nothing of me to your master. A chill ran over his skin. My master? The one who has ordered you to kill these men, she said softly. She should not know about him. She shouldn't even know that Sari was acting on the orders of another at all. This changed everything. Sari crossed his arms and considered her carefully. Investigating her usefulness without consulting the one who arranged the hunt had seemed like a small risk. Now it appeared to have been greater than he had thought. She knew too much. He ought to send his best knife to dispatch her, or kill her himself, now. Even as he thought it, he knew he wouldn't. And it's not just because I find her interesting, he told himself. I need to know how she learned so much about the arrangement. I'll wait, have her watched, and see where this leads. Have you told him about me? she asked. Why don't you want him to know about you? Her expression darkened. Two reasons. These slaves know only one enemy hunts them. It will be easier for me to help you if they do not know I am here. And there are people in my country who would suffer if the slaves' masters learned I was here. And you think these slaves would find out, it, uh, would find out about you if my master knew? Perhaps. Perhaps not. I'd rather not take the risk. You are only asking this now. I might have told my customer about you already. Did you? He shook his head. She smiled, clearly relieved. I didn't think you would. Not until you knew what I could do and, and um, n not until you knew I could do what I said I could. So, yeah, I really like, here's my theory. Well, you know what? All right. I'm going to wait until we get to the section later where we find out Akron's story. And then I'll share my theory on w how she knows what she knows. Um, but it doesn't seem like she has any magical ability of her own. She may, and we just not be aware of it, but you know, who knows? Um, so we have Sunia, um, in the library thinking to herself about the fact that, uh, she doesn't really know what Akron is after by showing her these books. Um, and she really doesn't know what this information can do for her. Like if anything, it's made her a little bit more afraid of him because now she's aware of just how strong he could be by doing what he does. Um, and as she's uh, sitting here in the library, there's a weird thing. Where there's these two girls who are looking at all of the male teachers and assessing how hot they think they are, pretty much. Um, so they start off talking about Lord Larkin. Um, I never considered him before, but he is fairly good looking, I suppose. And still unmarried. Not showing much interest in getting married from what I hear. Um, oh, look, there's Lord Darlin. He's nice. Pity he's married. Mm, the first agreed. What do you think of Lord Voril? Voril? You're kidding. Not one for strong warrior types, are you? And then, no, look there. Now that I wouldn't turn down. Oh, yes. The other agreed in a hushed voice. Look, he stopped to talk to Director Jarek. He's a bit cold, though. Oh, I'm sure he could be warmed up. He's so handsome. Pity he's too old for us. 
I don't know, the other replied. He's not that old. My cousin was married off to a man much older. He might not look it, but the High Lord is no more than thirty-three or four. Sania stiffened with surprise and disbelief. They were talking about Acheron. But of course they didn't know what he was like. They saw only an unmarried man who was mysterious, powerful, and and then it gets cut off. And I was like, and what? Is he hot? Like, what's, what's going on there? Um... How could those girls find him attractive, she wondered. He was harsh and aloof, not bright-eyed and warm like Dorian, or even slickly handsome like Lord Fergan. Um, so I, f- I can't imagine what this is setting up other than that there is going to turn out to be a weird little, like, thing between her and Acheron, because... Why do we need to hear that he's actually considered pretty attractive by other girls if if not to plant that in our heads, right? Um, but he is older enough than Sunia. Like, what is she, like 18 at this point? So, you know, still, I hope that that's not a thing, but we'll see. Um, and, yeah, I just can't imagine, like, I don't know what that's going to do. Um all right, so do, 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 yeah, this is a point the part where Daniel goes and meets this guy at the inn. Um so let's go to the chapter six, the little journey through the tunnels. Um Sania gets home and Akron summons her to his like basement study room, the room that she is very frightened by. And Takin tells her very confidently that he is not going to harm her. And we find out later the relationship between Takin and um, Akarin, And it makes a lot of sense because that was the main thing to me was that Takin or Takan, I'm going to call him Takan. Takan does not seem intimidated by Akarin. He doesn't seem like he views him as a master in the same way the other servants view their masters and feels more like they're equals. And this appears to be why. Um, so she goes in and is like considering trying to just run because she's so flipped out of being brought down here. But both times that she was down here, she saw him performing dark magic, right? So then she notices that he's wearing ordinary, like rough spun clothing and that he has an ordinary lantern as well. And he's not using a globe light. So he tells her to put on this cloak that he has for her and that he wants her to go into the tunnel with him. And she gets led out into the tunnels and remembers like that she had actually come across his study when she was exploring one time. But once she realized where she was, she didn't go any farther. So this time they do go farther and there are several barriers that are sort of built into the tunnel. And she realizes that she would have come across these had she continued exploring and maybe not been able to pass through them. Um, Maybe she could have if she had used her magic, but I have a sense that she wouldn't have wanted to draw attention to herself by messing with a spell like that. But, you know, now that we know what we know, it's clear that like Acheron is not taking any chances with there being a secret entrance into his hidey hole because he can't, you know, the, there are three barriers set up so they would get through one and they would still have two more to get through. Um, because this is a potential area that they could breach the place, you know, the Sachakins. So, um, as they're going, and, you know, I just got really, like, impatient with Sunia in, in, in a couple places. Like, um, they are walking out there, and she, you know, notes again how tr- much trouble he's taking to disguise himself. And thinks, if it's important that nobody recognizes him, then I have something I can use against him tonight if I need to. And I'm like, Sunia, he's about to show you some shit you need to stop being so suspicious of him specifically and start like looking at the fucking evidence that he's attempting to connect with you on this stuff because he has something to tell you. 
she's just so caught up in this narrative of him being a bad guy that she's unwilling to like open her mind at all. Um, so they get to this, uh, the thieves road, which she recognizes by the smell and the look of it. And there is a man who like, um, is apparently in front of this door, like as a guard, um, Morin, I think is his name. Um, yeah, Morin. And Akarin says, did you find a red gem on him? No. Searched him good. Found nothing. Akarin frowned. Very well. Stay here. This is Sunia. I will send her out in a while. Morin's eyes snapped to hers. The Sunia? Yes, the living, breathing legend, Akarin replied dryly. Morin smiled at her. Honored to meet you, my lady. Honored to meet you, Morin, she replied, bemusement overcoming her anxiety for a moment. Living, breathing legend? So yeah, I'm curious about that myself. Like, how has this legend expanded since she uh, busted the place up and got taken away to the guild? Um, so they go inside, and there is a really thin, sickly-looking man, manacled to a bed, and he is covered in scars, covered in them. And, you know, the revelation of uh, Savara earlier talking about slaves, pretty much, you know, I, I started to be like, oh, I bet they're made to, like, it. it this just confirmed a suspicion that had, like, um started to bubble up as soon as I read that word being used. First of all, Akarin figures out exactly where this red gem is. Uh, there is a gold tooth in his mouth with a gem in the middle. And it's just so ingenious to me to put it there. I just, you know, wow. Wow. And Akron sm like smashes it on the floor, but the guy is pretty confident that if the uh, magician who put that tooth there is watching, he's already seen Sania and is going to try and like get to her. Um, so yeah, I'm just like really curious if that's true because we know that like Akron isn't always. What's the word I want? Tuned in to what what's going on around Lorlin, you know? It's like he catches things for sure. But I don't know, like, what, this kind of gem, does it DVR things? Does it make it so that you can go back and look at what happened, even if you're not watching at the right moment? Um, or do you have to employ mind reading for that part, you know? But... Sania sees that it's glass um, and realizes that there's something else going on here that she doesn't understand. And Akron is like, hey, look, okay, Sania, I'm going to need you to read this guy's mind. And at first she thinks when he's like, I'm going to teach you how to, she cuts him off and she's like, I will not learn black magic. And he's like, I fucking know that. Can you calm down? I want you to learn how to read the mind of someone who isn't willing. Um, and that is because the truth is in this man's head, in his memories. And he isn't going to share that shit voluntarily. But if you don't see it, you won't believe me. Because I'll try and tell you what happened and what I know. And without the proof from him, it's not going to hold any water with you. So I'm going to need you to practice this and get in there and see for yourself and you can judge what's going on here for yourself. So this is when she delves in and she manages to pick it up fairly quickly, how to like kind of get around the barriers that he has there. Um, and she has to promise that she's never, ever going to use the skill unless Kiralia is under threat because it's it's just dangerous and it's wrong, kind of wrong. It's invasive. You know, it's uh, a violation. So um, she goes in there 
And I'm trying to find the exact spot where she manages to like get through. Here we go. Um, who are you? Akarin asked Tavaka. Abruptly, Sania became aware that he had been a slave until recently. Who is your master? Harikava, a powerful Achani. A face, distinctly Sachakin, flashed through his mind. It was a cruel face, hard and clever. What are the Ichani? Powerful magicians. Why do they keep slaves? For magic. A multi-layered memory flashed through Sunia's mind. She had the impression of countless memories of the same incident, the slight pain of a shallow cut, the drawing of power. The Ichani, she understood suddenly, used black magic to draw power from their slaves, constantly strengthening themselves. No more, I am a slave no longer. Harikava freed me. The memory flashed through Tavaka's mind. Harikava sat in a tent. He spoke, saying he would free Tavaka if he undertook a dangerous mission. Sania sensed Akarin take control of the memory. The mission was to enter Kiralia and find out if Kariko's words were true. Was the guild weak? Had it spurned the use of greater magic? Many slaves had failed. If he succeeded, he would be accepted among the Achani. If not, they would hunt him down. Harikava opened a wooden box trimmed in gold and gems. Taking out a sliver of something clear and hard, he tossed it in the air. It floated there, slowly melting before Tavaka's gaze. So she gets to see the creation of this gem, the deal that he made, and it cuts away, thankfully, before the guy digs out one of the man's like actual teeth and replaces it with this. Um, and there is a moment of a memory that the man tries to hide from her that she has to pull back out. Um, names and faces followed, but one stood out. Kariko, the man who wants to kill Akarin. Why? Akarin killed his brother. Any slave that turns on his master must be hunted down and punished. She almost lost control of his memory at that. Akarin had been a slave? Because of Akarin, because Kariko's brother captured Akarin and read his mind, we know the guild is weak. Kariko says the guild does not use greater magics. He says we will invade Karelia and defeat the guild easily. It will be a fine revenge for what the guild did to us after the war. Um, Akarin questions him about like when the invasion will be. There is no answer to that. Then there is um, a memory of this guy's family being basically butchered because they all have magical talent and the uh, dude who was in charge did not want any other the Ichani master did not want to cart the entire group around with him just in case and he would not leave any potential sources of power around for his enemies to find and use so yikes um and we get to see like what he's done since he's come to Karalia and, um, let's see, if he was careful, he would grow strong enough to defeat Akarin. Then he would return to Sachaka, help Kariko gather the Ichani, and they would invade Karalia. A man was chosen and followed, a knife, a gift from Harikava, drawn, and time to leave, Sunia. Why did, why did you do that? And he says, you were about to learn what you don't wish to learn. So we were about to see some black magic happening. Um... And she has to go and have a drink to kind of calm herself down. And then they head back to, well, she gets sent out, has her drink, and Akron very clearly kills the guy. And then they go back to the guild. But Sania is very aware that that guy is 100% going to murder again if they release him. It's not a question. Like, they have to do this. Um, and... Let's see. Okay. Akarin's story is the next chapter and I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to jump ahead to that. I already talked about Sari and uh, Sarana and do, do, do. I'm trying to find if there's anything about that, that I didn't really cover. Why are they sending their slaves here? They seek to regain power and state. And Oh, right, right. This thing. Um, do, do, do. Oh, she talks about the fact that um, they send people into the wastes in uh, Sachaka 
if they have done something illegal or displeased the king in some way, and that um, these Ichani are basically people who are in the wastes, who have no other recourse and are being, they've been basically exiled, but left to their own devices, which seems like a really bad idea to me. But um, it turns out that now they are sending a bunch of slaves at a time. They're not one by one. Um, and let's see, the Shachakan king sends those who have earned his disfavor out into the wastes. Um, they seek to regain power and status by defeating Sachaka's old enemy, the guild. Um, he, probably nothing to worry about, he thought. We're killing off these slaves easily enough. Um, and he asks, like, well, if you can find them and kill them, why don't you just do it? And she says, but if I did, you might mistake me for one of them. And this is when they get interrupted by Morin. And he tells Sari about how Sania was with Akarin this time. And Sari's just kind of like, fuck, Sania, I'm over here, like, totally macking on this girl. And I just haven't even given her a second thought. And then he's like, but Sania doesn't even like me like that. Why am I even worried about this? Which is my question. Um, but he clearly still does have some feelings for her. It's just, you know. The, he's acting like he was being disloyal to her when really he's being disloyal to himself. I think he feels. Um, so that section ends with uh, send the high Lord a message. We need to talk. So then we go to Akarin who is about to speak to Lorlin about something important. When someone comes in asking uh, Akarin, if he, if, she, if he knows where Sania is because she didn't show up to class and he knows uh, evidently where she goes to like hang out and be by herself because he comes there. She's in the woods kind of sitting on this stone alone, like thinking things through everything that she's seen. There is this moment that's like, um, yeah, this, this whole thing is changing the way that she sees everything. Um, she realizes he was secretly and single-handedly keeping these Achani at bay by killing off their spies. He was not the person she had thought he was. He might even be a good person. She frowned. Let's not go that far. He learned black magic somehow, and I'm still a hostage. Without black magic, however, how could he defeat these spies? And if there was a good reason for keeping all this a secret... He'd had no choice but to ensure she, Rothen, and Lorlin remained silent. So this is when he shows up um, and he tells her the entire story of everything that happened. He admits that he was a little bored at school, decided that he wanted to travel the world, and he decided that writing a book on ancient magic would serve as an excellent excuse for being able to go out there and travel. And he sees some, like some references to high magic that get him interested. And he doesn't know what this means because, you know, he's a kid and nobody has told him. So he follows those leads into Sachaka, which is almost exactly what happened to Daniel before he got called back. Um, he says, if I'd kept to the main road, I might have been safe. The occasional Karelian trader en enters Shachaka in search of exotic goods. The king sends diplomats there every few years in the company of magicians. But Shachaka is a big country and a secretive one. The guild knows there are magicians there, but understands little about them. I entered from Eileen straight into the wastes. I was there for a month before I encountered one of the Achani. I saw tents and animals and thought to introduce myself to this wealthy and important traveler. He welcomed me warmly enough and introduced himself as Dakova. I sensed that he was a magician and was intrigued. He pointed at my robes and asked if I was of the guild. I said I was. I thought that being one of the strongest magicians of the guild, I would be able to defend myself against anything. The Sachakans I'd encountered were poor farmers, frightened by visitors. I should have taken that as a warning. When Dakova attacked me, I was surprised. 
I asked if I had offended him, but he didn't reply. His strikes were incredibly powerful, and I barely had time to realize I was going to lose before I neared the end of my strength. I told him that stronger magicians would come looking for me if I did not return to the guild. That must have worried him. He stopped. I was so exhausted I could barely stand, and I thought that was the reason he managed to read my mind so effectively. For a few days, I thought I'd betrayed the guild. But later, when I spoke to Dakova's slaves, I learned that the Ichani were able to get past the mind's barriers at any time. So this is the first time that we encounter this magic of being able to read an unwilling person's mind. Dakova learned from my mind the guild had ma- banned black magic and was much weaker than the Sachakins believed. He was so amused by what he saw in my mind, he decided that other Ichani had to see it, and I was too exhausted to resist. Slaves took my robes and gave me old rags to wear. At first, I couldn't grasp that these people were slaves and that I was now one as well. Then, when I understood, I would not accept it. I tried to escape, but Dakova found me easily. He seemed to enjoy the hunt and the punishment he dealt out afterwards. Um, so every night, Dakova would drain Akron of his power so that there was no way that he could escape. In the, in the night and so that he himself can take on that power because Akarin apparently was a quite a nice little resource you know like yikes I'm sure that was a real like high for him in a way um Akarin starts to figure out that everybody in the wastes are outcasts um failed involvement in plots inability to pay bribes or taxes or committing crimes they had fallen out of favor with the Sachakan king he had ordered them confined to the wastes and forbidden others to contact them you might think they would band together in this situation but they nursed too much resentment and ambition for that they constantly plotted against each other hoping to increase their wealth and strength or to take revenge for past insults or simply steal supplies of food an outcast Achani can only feed so many slaves. The waste sealed little food, and terrorizing and killing farmers certainly doesn't help increase productivity. The woman who explained everything to me at the beginning was a strong potential magician. She might have been a powerful healer if she had been born Karelian. Instead, Dakova kept her as a bed slave. Akron grimaced. Dakova attacked another Achani one day and found himself losing. In desperation, he took all the strength of each of his slaves, killing them. He left the strongest of us to last, and managed to overcome his adversary before killing us all. Only myself and Takan survived. Dakova was vulnerable for several weeks while he recovered the strength he'd lost. He was less worried that another would take advantage of this than he might have been, however. All Ichani knew that he had a brother, Kariko. The pair had made it known that if one should be killed, the other would avenge his death. No Ichani in the Wastes could defeat one of the brothers and regain regain their strength in time to survive an attack by the other. So that is a pretty smart insurance policy. Um, So, this is when, obviously, Akron starts to care less and less about the fucking guild rules and realizes that he needs to do some shit that is not approved of in order to survive. And he says he did not need black magic to perform evil. I saw him do things with his bare hands that I will never forget. And I'm just like, oh, God. Um, so then at one point, Dakova hears that an Ichani he despised was hiding in a mine after exhausting himself in a fight. And he decides to go find him and kill him. When D- Dakova arrived, the mine appeared to be deserted. He, myself, and the other slaves entered the tunnels in search of his enemy. After several hundred paces, the floor collapsed under me. I felt myself caught by magic and set down on a hard surface. I had been saved by another Ichani. Um, He took me through the tunnels to a small hidden room and made me an offer. He would teach me black magic if I would return to Dakova and kill him. Um, I saw... it. uh, I saw that it was an arrangement that would probably end in my death. I would fail and die or succeed and be hunted down by Kariko. By then, I cared little for my own life or for the guild's ban on black magic, so I agreed. So what he does is he goes back out there and lies to Dakova about the fact that 
um, he called, he fell through the floor because things like you know were unstable, but that he found a storeroom that had food and other like treasures in it in order to convince Dakova to go back in there. Um, and thankfully, Dakova is not. It doesn't even enter his mind that this is a trick because he could read Akarin's mind if he wants and find out immediately, but he doesn't sense that at all. So he doesn't read his mind. Um, and I sent a slave out with a box of Eileen wine. The dust coating the bottles reassured Dakova they hadn't been tampered with and he began drinking. They were laced with Mick, a drug that confuses the mind and distorts the senses. When I left the mine, he was lying in a dreamlike state. So th at this point, Akarin stops talking and Sunia is like, you better finish this fucking story because I'm about to die. And then he tells her he killed all of Dakova's new slaves because he needed their strength in order to to overcome him, even with a drug, you know, but he couldn't kill Takan. He felt too guilty about it. Um, the two of them weren't exactly friends, but they had had each other's backs the whole time, and he just couldn't bear to do that. Um, Dakova was too addled by the drug and the wine to notice much. He woke as I cut him, but once the draining of power begins, it's almost impossible to use your powers. Though I was now stronger than I had ever imagined I could be, I knew Kariko was not far away. He would try to contact Kova and then come looking for an explanation for his brother's silence. So he takes off without even thinking through, like taking supplies with him or anything. But thankfully, Takan does have a fucking sense, like common sense, and packs a bunch of stuff and follows him. And he tries to get rid of Takan and doesn't want to bring him with him back to Kirelia because he's afraid. But he realizes that, like, okay, if I make him a servant, then he'll be, at, like, more free than he was. And he probably is safer with me than with anybody. Um, so he comes back and everybody is like, you know, well, where where have you been? It's been a minute. And he just makes up a story of, like, going up into the mountains to study alone in solitude. So that's what that whole like missing time bit is was him being fucking enslaved and having power stolen from him over and over again. And he shows Sania the scars all up and down his arm from being cut repeatedly. Jesus Christ, you know? Um, so he is really surprised when, when Lord Balkan presents him as the option for next high Lord, because the old one died. And he says, it's interesting what people will overlook when they desperately want to avoid electing a man they don't like. And Sunia wants to ask who this is that they don't like. I also would like to know, um, but we don't find out. And I'm wondering, was it Geralt? Like, cause you know, I just, there's something there with Geralt. Um, so, Balkan is pretty like pushy about him becoming high Lord. And he finds out that like everybody else is on board. Um, especially because they let, let him test his strength and he's obviously stronger than anybody else. So this also explains because, you know, people had talked about before how, um, or I think it was actually specifically Lorlin had talked about how he and Akron had been at a similar level. And then Akron went away and came back and was suddenly way stronger. And he assumed it was black magic, which it turns out it is, but like not because Akron was ambitious and just going out there learning shit for the sake of it more because of this like enslavement and desperate need to survive. Um, after a few years, I heard about murders in the city that sounded suspiciously like black magic. I investigated and found the first spy. I learned that Kiriko had been stirring up the other Achani with ideas of plundering Imardine, taking revenge for the Sachakan War, and forcing the Sachakan king to accept them again. Which I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like, if you overcome these people, and you're in, not in the king's good graces, that might help. Um, and yeah, I'm just like really curious about how this is all going to play out. Um, and she asks him 
like, why haven't you told Lorlin? And he says, if I let Lorlin like mind read me to know this truth, then he, he might learn about how to use black magic. And I just can't have anybody else knowing how to do this. Like, to which I'm like, I don't, I think that you should let other people learn how to do this. That's obviously the only way that you're going to be able to come up against these people in the end. But, um, so yeah. Um, remember, I knew there was no immediate threat from Sachaka when I first arrived. Um, not only Kariko convinces the other, not until Kariko convinces the other Achani to join him, will there actually be a real threat. And she's like, well, but the sooner the guild knows, the more prepared they, they'll they be. But he's like, preparation isn't going to help, basically. Um, until I find a way for them to fight back, them knowing about it is not going to be any good. So he says that he's just going to continue hunting spies. He, you know, confesses being paired up with the thieves on this. Um, and let's see, what's the next thing? Why did you tell me this? He smiled grimly. Somebody else needs to know. But why me? You knew so much already. Well, can we tell Rothen? No, not unless we must reveal everything to the guild. What if he tries to do something about me? Oh, I'm watching Rothen closely. Um, Sania felt a strange mixture of fear and respect. He had killed many times. He had learned and used the darkest magic. Yet he had done it to escape slavery and to keep the guild safe, and nobody but she and Takan knew. So, yeah, that's the end of that section. And I'm like, oh, shit. This just, it changes everything about the way that she's going to operate now. And Rothen and Lorlin don't know, so their attitude toward Akron isn't going to change. Which means they're not going to understand why she's suddenly more, uh, like, amenable to him. And they're going to wonder if she isn't being, like, taught black arts herself, you know? Um, yeah, I'm just like, man, I want to know what this, like, weapon is. If it is it in those other books that she hasn't gotten a chance to read yet? Like, what's going on? So, yeah. Um, thank you again to Ashley for commissioning this episode. I barely had enough time to talk about everything, but no regrets. I'm just really glad that I got to read that section this soon. And, um... I'm just, I, you know, this whole thing with uh, Regin touching all of the other um, apprentices, I'm wondering if they're, that's like, or the other novices in order to try and overcome Sania. I'm wondering if there's a way to tap into somebody else's energy without killing them. If there's a way to, you know, he obviously is doing something and Akron was able to give his magic over to Geralt to like help him recover strength. Is that as effective as blood magic or no? Uh, so that's my question until next time. Thank you all so much for listening. Thanks again to Ashley. Hope you're enjoying and toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.